I want to tell you guys about a movie called Bo is Afraid. It's one of these movies that I most like to do reviews of because it's very metaphorical, it's very symbolic, and the movie is not literally happening before your eyes. But it's not all also a purely symbolic movie like, say, Denis Villeneuve's Enemy that I've told you before where none of it's literally happening. But it's more like that in that it is about something that is happening. And it's not like a completely, like, mysterious and opaque movie like a Mulholland Drive. It's, I believe, even though there's some open interpretation shit in it, right, it's not subjective. I think there is a clear message in this movie, a real subtext, that is not as difficult to understand as one might think, except for it's describing an experience that is somewhat unique to only a certain kind of man. And for Ari Aster, the director, to have made this movie, when he, for the first time, he was given $35 million budget to make a movie, and he made a movie I think only half of the human race could understand completely. And unless it's like, unless you're a mother who's raised a disturbed son, you're probably not going to get this unless you're a guy who was raised by a single mother and had a toxic relationship with that mother. Um, I think that's 100% what this film is about. I don't think that's the only way you can access this movie. But I think that what I'm about to describe to you, and spoilers, and I recommend watching the movie before you listen to this, I'm going to explain to you the ending. So I can't go over every part of this movie or we'll be here for two hours. And this movie's three hours long. All I can say is I loved this movie, but I was also very, like, traumatized by it. It was one of the most frightening movies I think I've ever seen, not because it was spooky or scary and it had jump scares, because it was, I felt very, I related to the movie very much through my own personal experience, and the way I was relating to it is about things that I'm ashamed of in my past, things I regret in my past. Um, I, I, I've intimated before and I can't really review this movie without talking about myself a little bit directly, even though I look, I don't like doing that. Um, it was about the worst parts of my life. So it was like traumatizing in that way. Cause it was about things I'm scared of in real life, even though there's some kind of monsters and kind of demonic elements to this movie that it's very, you know, much Ari Aster style, what he's describing is very human monsters. So just to really quickly recap who Bo is and what Bo is Afraid is about, Bo is Afraid is about a man who is raised by an overbearing single mother. Um, he believes his mother has just died not too long into the start of the movie and that he's trying to make his way home to her funeral. And it's kind of a almost, oh, brother, where art thou? Madcap odyssey to get there where he goes through some wild experiences and then there's that really crazy ending that I'm going to try to explain to you. But... In brief, what kind of the movie is is about is that, you know, the kind of hook of it is that Bo's mother has told him, your father, who you've never known, died like in our marital bed, on our honeymoon bed. The first time he ever had an orgasm, he had one inside me. You were born and he died. And he passed that down to you so that if you ever have sex with a woman, you will die. But... That doesn't mean that he's ne she's necessarily trying to keep him away from women. I think even that line isn't literal. It's sort of a part of what this movie is really about. And what this movie is about is how this mother has kind of ruined her son. But what has truly ruined her son isn't even just the horrible shit she's directly done to him. It's the fact that he doesn't have a father. Because thematically, what Bo is about is about a man with no male role models, with no father, with a, with a dysfunctional mother, and what that does to a man. It is about an emasculated man, and I believe that's part of the symbolism. The fact that he's never had an orgasm, and has never had sex, and he's a, he's a, uh, a virgin incel, is about how his mother has destroyed his ability to have relationships with women, as well as deprived him of relationships with men. So we got to get down to, and, and only kind of briefly go over, like, who I think each of these characters that he's kind of run into and had more meaningful experiences with 
and what those mean. Well, first, everybody kind of interprets the beginning as a surrealist or absurdist comedy because he looks like he lives in, like, well, modern-day San Francisco, where everybody's some kind of murderous lunatic or drug addict or vandal or thief. But everyone at least interpreted that as anxiety, which is not on the money. It's not bullseye what that's about. It's about fear. And that fear is one of the many sides of just emasculation. And this movie's about emasculation. And some people, I guess, have criticized Ari Aster's, you know, movie Midsommar as kind of a feminist man-hating movie, which I did not get that at all. I believed that Midsommar was almost like a companion to Bo's Afraid, but it was about uh, toxic relationships of a dysfunctional young woman. Bo's Afraid is about the broken, um, just sexless, dickless emasculation of a pathetic older man. So the more important characters that he runs to past that initial long intro part with the, the crazy, I'm, I'm afraid of everyone around where I live in this San Francisco looking area with all the crazy, you know, gangbangers and the, the naked stabber and all that shit. Um, yeah, all that's kind of metaphorical. And in my opinion, the, um, that sequence, I believe results in him not being able to function on his own. And then the next sequence is when he's rescued by that married couple who have that young daughter and their dead army vet son. And then out in the trailer in the back, they also keep this um, nonverbal post-traumatic stress, mentally insane veteran who is a friend of their son, right? I don't think any of these people are literal. I think these are an example of him going into a therapeutic environment of some kind, presumably a psych ward or a rehab depending on how you look at it. But it, that part, I believe, is open to interpretation. But what it's saying about each character and what these characters represent, I don't believe is as subjective. When, and I, I guess I'm maybe speaking from personal experience, but I doubt it. So, you know, grain of salt. I believe what these people represent, the Nathan Lane character in, in The Wife um, represent people trying to help you much like the therapist and much like the therapist that are ineffectual and somewhat harmful as well as unable to get through to Bo either way. And Bo doesn't trust them because even though they're trying to help him, how they're trying to help him, they're helping him by controlling him. They're helping him by giving him prescription drugs. Um, he, he encounters their very, very dysfunctional 13 year old daughter. And she shows how she and the mother of this family also show how women are in this movie are also fucked up and why they're fucked up, I believe is kind of clearly intimated. Like the mother is overbearing and traumatized by the death of her son. And she wants to go out there and mother more men while neglecting their daughter. And the father just wants to give him pills and ignore him and tell him everything's okay, which is not helpful. Right? So there it's sort of a bad parenting, bad father figure, also bad caretaker, whether it's a therapist or something like that. He's also again, like a medical professional, a surgeon this time, instead of just a, uh, a therapist, but it, it, he, he's still shown the same level of lack of trust and also in him not really helping. So it kind of is a double-edged thing, but the daughter is fucked up because she also is not being given love and attention. And they put Bo in her room instead of their dead son's room is that's not in use or on the couch while he's staying there. And they introduce him to this other man they're taking care of. And this man by the way, I don't believe is a literal person. The man that they're taking care of, I think, is one of the most important parts of the movie. One of the most important characters in the movie is this nonverbal post-traumatic stress lunatic fat guy army vet, right? I think his name's Greg. Because what Greg is, is actually a manifestation of Bo. Greg is going to represent, now that Bo's out of his, his hidey hole environment and away from his mother, him starting to discover his own masculinity. And this masculinity is voiceless, directionless, deranged, and aggressive. And, you know, anybody who, who is tired of man-hating movies, and when they hear toxic masculinity, they hear like, oh, well, you're saying that a man who's aggressive and confident and assertive and takes control of things is toxic. And that might be what feminists and stupid-ass leftists say what toxic masculinity is. What to toxic masculinity really is, is Bo. A directionless, uh, malformed, maladapted, 
sexless, resentful, confused, frightened, and afraid pussy. That's toxic masculinity. And that's what Bo is. So I think now that he's getting his first taste of kind of being a man, what manifests is this voiceless, violent, weird thing that is still something that's just doing what it's told, which is what Bo has always done, done what he's told. And okay, so he, he gets through that situation and then there's the whole dream sequence, which I want to go over very briefly or we'll be here very long. But the dream sequence is when Bo starts to have hope, when he's in the hippie commune and he has the dream sequence during the play and he wishes he could have a family. And it still shows how, what lack of perception he has with, uh, with having a healthy relationship with a woman because he doesn't really even know his wife in his own fantasy. Just that he has sex with her and that she gives him sons. And then he loses her and loses his sons and spends his whole life trying to find them again. He loses them in a cataclysm, right? And, and the whole thing is about him coming back to them and finding them and them accepting him. And that's still him trying to re-embrace his masculinity and, and how it's still not the right idea, right? And so... Even that doesn't work it out, and he can't stay there because in comes charging the army vet guy. Because after the girl has killed herself, and just to briefly the sim the symbolization of the 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 dysfunctional girl in the kind of rehab setting with the crazy parents, right? She kills herself by dragging Bo into the room of the dead son and trying to force him to help her desecrate it. And she splashes the pink paint all over the walls a little bit more. Um, obvious symbolism and then kills herself by drinking half a, a fucking can of blue paint. And then when her mother discovers that she's destroyed herself, she immediately blames Bo and then he freaks out and, and flees. And I, that might be saying something a little bit less thematic and a little bit more serious, but it's just maybe something I didn't get about the movie, but uh, we're going to try to move on to the end so that we can spend the last 20 some odd minutes of this video talking about the end. So the end is he go, he misses his mother's funeral. He arrives there and you know, his mother has died apparently by having her head crushed. So there's no head in, in the casket. And I think that can mean a number of things, but Bo intimates once he discovers that his mother is not dead and that she's faked her death that he knew. So that could mean a number of things like maybe he's thought he's put to bed his toxic relationship with his mother or fled from it, even though he hasn't dealt with it. And once he reconnects with the girl that he's been seeing in flashbacks to the only kind of intimate relationship he's had with a female is when he was very young and kissed a, a girl. And this girl was kind of very wild and he related to her and that she also hated her mother. And, and Bo won't even admit that he hates his mother, not then and not as an adult. He doesn't admit his mother until his mother comes back into the story, but we'll get there. But here's the part where that thro throws a lot of people off. So I'm going to explain the ending. And um, <clears throat> so here's what happens at the sequence. So he reencounters Elaine, the girl that he loves, and he doesn't even notice. Like he loves her and he doesn't even notice like everything Elaine says implies that she's greedy implies that she's impersonal, implies that she is selfish, and and she immediately just sexually objectifies him, herself to him at a, in, an, in, a, in a selfish way, and he interprets it as love. That's something a lot of men with bad role models go through. And of course, Bo is like any man, kind of has an Oedipus complex. And to explain what that briefly is, it's not that he wants to fuck his mother. It's what an Oedipus complex... I, I think Freud might have meant that, but what he was right about isn't that you literally want to fuck your mom. It's that your mom teaches who you who you're going to date and who you're going to fuck. And if your if your mom is not a good person and you and or you have a negative relationship with your mother, your early romantic relationships will be with toxic women. And the same goes for daughters. And their fathers. We call that just daddy issues instead of a psychologically charged term like Oedipus complex. So, <clears throat> so he thinks he's about to fuck this woman. He also believes that if he has sex with this woman, he will have a heart attack and die. But you see what a broken man he is and what traumatizing shit he's gone through in the film. He's okay with that. So he fucks her and he has an orgasm and he doesn't die and he's in shock and elation. And then she keeps having sex with him. And then the second she has an orgasm, 
this is where the movie throws almost everybody off. It almost threw me off. He looks up, so glad that he hasn't died, only to see that on top of him, with him inside her, this woman has done like a ring, and, and she's like, and she's dead, and her eyes are all sunken in and rotten, and she's all fucked up, and she's like, ah, oh, and she's literally locked in rigor mortis in place like this, with her fingers between her legs and her hands in her hair, and he shoves her off him and she collapses to the ground like a statue and he crumples over to the ground and he seems to be in complete shock that even though okay i'm no longer an incel and i got laid and i i, I found the woman and the love i've been seeking for all this time and it's immediately turned to the most horrifying thing he's ever seen and before he can even make sense of that in walks his mother and i think that's a deliberate thing that his mother walks in right after that because that's like almost a sign saying here i am here's the i am the reason why you can't have a good relationship with women and then th they ha have a, a big fight and they they you know argue and they finally say all the horrible things they really feel about each other because even though it's very clear that you know at least when you've heard her on the phone that bo's mother is an emotionally manipulative woman and selfish and when you see Bo's mother in flashbacks, she's an oddly inappropriate woman who talks to Bo like he is a, a man and tries to teach him how to woo women and looks at him arguably like the way a woman looks at a, a sexual partner, not the way she looks at her son. And there's probably some subtext in that. Not that I believe she ever sexually abused him, but that she was sending him all the wrong single sing, uh, signals at the wrong age about how to mature and be a man. And they were always inappropriate and backwards and weird. And... But now she's here saying, I resent you for this. I resent you for never appreciating me. Even when you're a baby, you wouldn't breastfeed from me. You rejected me at every turn. And, and she brings up all this shit from his past and even abuses stuff that he's only told his therapist, but his therapist has apparently told her about his resentments towards her, even though he didn't even like clearly say, I resent my mother outright. Um it's like almost selectively edited. So like the scenes he'd been talking to this therapist, all that shows is just what sounds like I resent my mother. I don't respect my mother. You know, I don't care about all my mother's done for me. And she says all this to him and he finally confronts her. But when he confronts her, you know, he immediately regrets it. And then she, you know, rejects his apology and is even more vicious towards her. And then he seems to kill her and like throw her on the ground and I think just before that, though, I, I tend to mix up these two things in the order they happen. Um, but I can't even 100% remember what happens first. But at sort of the simultaneous time as that, uh, Bo's mom, fi finally when he confronts her about like the dreams he's had, about how come you won't tell me about my father? She says, oh, you want to know my your father? And she wants to drag him up to the attic. And he's like, oh, no, I've had a recurring nightmare about you throwing me into the attic. And it, it's terrifying. I don't want to know what's up there. And a lot of people think when she says, guess what's up there in the attic and, and, and shows him it's, and it's his father. It's not literally his father in the attic. The attic represents everything she's hidden from Bo about his father because she won't tell him about who his father is just that your father your father died in the act of conceiving you and which i don't believe for a second was true because keep in mind that that there's a scene where Bo me meets a man who he thinks is his father so he's like told her like i know he's alive i know you were lying well when she throws him in the attic she's she's telling him no this is what your father is and from this woman's selfish evil you know fucking psychotic and, and sociopathic perception, whatever she reveals of Bo's father to him is going to be negative. It's going to be something terrible. It's either something real or personally perceived about this man that is monstrous. And so when Bo first sees his father in the flashlight, it's, it's not the man that he thought was his father. And it's not a man who looks like who Bo's father would be. It's him. But he's 
both groaning in pain, but also rumbling like a monster. And then the flashlight goes out again. And this is where I really started to relate this movie. Because like I said, I, I you know, to make keep it brief, I was raised by a dysfunctional woman who the female role models that she, you know, exposed me to were very, very bad role models, uh, you know, abusive men. And my mother, even though she was not really good at communicating with me and she did express a lot of resentment to me, she wasn't an idiot and she wasn't even that malicious. She was just very confused and emotionally stunted herself. And, and like Bo's mother, she was a very successful and in, in, in not wealthy, but very well off woman. And she's an engineer. And, but she also, you know, did a lot to participate in me having a fucked up childhood, a lot of it. And I didn't turn out a great young adult, at least. Thankfully, I got to be a, a, a more even killed, like sane and wise dude, you know, younger than Bo, at least. But it, it was hard work. So, but like, I never knew my father. Uh, the last time I physically laid eyes on mother was when I was a six, um, uh, physically laid eyes on my father. I was a six week old infant. So I only know the little of what my mother's told about him, which hasn't been negative so much as I didn't really want to know what, who he was so that I couldn't miss him and long for him in the same way that Bo has been constantly told about his, his father, even though it's limited information and made to miss his father. So when he finally asks and he sees his monster, his father, his father's some kind of prisoner and some kind of even more fucked up version of himself. And then the light goes out and then it comes back on. And here's the part where everybody laughs and goes like, Oh, what the fuck is this? This is absurd because the thing that was his father is now a gigantic monstrous personified dick and balls. It is a 15 foot tall dick and balls monster. And it looks like it's going to kill him. And everyone's like, well, what the fuck is that about? And some people are about, well, there it is. There, the, the movie is monstering all men. There it is. That's the, the toxic masculinity. Well, think about the context of it. That is the missing father. That is the personification of, I don't think so much of like Bo's masculinity, but all the horrible shit that his mother has just dumped on him about who his father is. It could even be all of Bo's terror and grief at realizing what has been stolen from him. What has been stolen from him is a father. And not only what's literally been stolen from him is a father, what's metaphorically been stolen from him is his own dick and balls. It's a symbol. It's a metaphor. But then who crashes in but a character we thought was dead in the crazy hippie fucking uh, play scene? The the mute, psycho, violent, murderous uh, army vet guy. But who did I tell you I think that army vet guy is? That's Bo. And so when he charges in, even though like in the narrative and the plot of the movie, this army vet guy has been charged with killing Bo, he doesn't attack Bo. He attacks the dick and balls monster. And the dick and balls monster kills him. So this character that I believe is the representative of Bo's fledgling masculinity that comes from being apart from his overbearing and toxic mother and his own isolation from everything, including all men, this thing has attacked this monstrous representation of his missing father. And then after that, he reconfronts his mother and kills her only again. She's not dead because that was him admitting not just to himself, but to his mother that he hates her viciously fucking hates her and is fully aware of what she's done to him. But then after that comes, you'd think that'd be a climactic scene, but after that comes another even weirder scene. And I think I can explain it to you and I'll try to do it as quick as possible. So we can stay under 40 minutes, hopefully under 35, right? So he thinks he's killed his mother. So he goes and he once again, goes off on his own in isolation, but he's going off to even more unfamiliar, even more lonely place, some kind of weird black canal in the, in the black sea at night. Only when he arrives there, what is he faced with? He's faced with this great big audience. He's faced with another confusing and threatening male figure who has no name. And his mother is there again. And it's like he's on trial and he's in this boat and the boat has stalled out and he's stuck in this, this 
water amphitheater where he's on a boat in water and he's surrounded by a stadium of people who seem to be there to witness him. And it's it seems like now that Bo's been hiding everybody, now that any like at any point in the in the story where it's being explained that somebody can see him, they hate him. So it's like now that it's representing that people can see him, that he's on trial and that he's being judged. And his prosecutor isn't just his mother, but some kind of dark male. And it's unclear whether that male is a representation of his father or a judge or God or, or something like that. It's one of those. It's, it's probably more than likely than not his actual, another representation of his father, but I can't say that for sure. And this, 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 this judging male is, is again, explaining all the horrible stuff that Bo's ever done to his mother. Um, the, the lack of appreciation, the resentment, the rejection, you know, all of the above, everything. And his mother is baying for his blood and implying that he's on trial for his life. And at the end, it, it, but, but you go like, well, where's the person on Bo's side? Well, you can't see them, but far off in the background, there's some kind of advocate that you can barely hear. I don't even know how well you'd hear him in the theater, but I could hear him in my headphones from far away saying like, he was only a boy. He was innocent. He was afraid. He needed guidance. And nobody's listening to this guy. And in fact, one of some members of the crowd killed this guy. They killed this advocate. So that's probably another representation of even though that Bo is aware of and maybe has heard from somebody that it's not his fault, he doesn't believe them and he doesn't believe anybody believes they, anybody would be on his side. He doesn't think anybody's on his side. Nobody understands him. And at the end, the, 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 the male judge character sentences Bo to death. And it's implied that this, this boat is going to sink and the engine was on fire and that Bo can't get out of the boat. But does the boat sink slowly as Bo looks up in shock and horror at his mother and this judge? No. And another one of those classic, shocking, sparingly used, but perfectly executed and sound mixed, even jump scares. The boat doesn't just sink. It suddenly rumbles and then snaps shut like a pair of jaws. Like a Venus flytrap, it snaps around him and presumably kills him. And then the credits begin to roll and people begin to leave all the aisles and abandon Bo. And I believe if there is a literal sort of symbol to this, it's either through suicide or, or perhaps execution for literally killing his mother, but more than likely suicide. Um, that the after it has snapped shut and capsized, it doesn't look like a boat that is tipped over and capsized. As it has snapped shut and kind of gone over like this, the angle of the way it's floating in the water is very visually reminiscent of a coffin, implying that Bo is in actually indeed dead. But his mother, who's been baying for his blood and, and, and just spitting hatred at him for these last couple of scenes in the movie, how does she react when Bo is now destroyed or dead? She wails in grief and says, no, no, no. Oh, God, my baby, my baby. And I mean, personally, I, I relate to that because as much as my mother did to harm me, it was harming me through her toxic relationships with men and refusing to realize that these men are horribly abusing her and horribly traumatizing me in, in those situations and didn't understand why I was demanding that if, you know, hey, if you love me, if I'm your son, you will throw this monster out of this house. And she's like, why would you make me choose between two men I love? And of course, part of her attraction to abusive men was partly because I was, you know, a mentally, uh, mentally ill child. So, you know, she didn't know how to take care of me. And maybe she thought she could fulfill her need to mother somebody by mothering her boyfriends instead of me. You understand like how I relate to this movie. I don't want to get too personal about it because my relationship with my mother now as a grown adult is, is, is fantastic. All that's water under the bridge now. It's been sorted out in a healthy way that is not like the way Bo argues with his mother, but I have had arguments almost exactly like that with my mother. You know, that's why I was very personally affected by this film. And even, even oftentimes I felt like I couldn't explain to my mother how hurt I was. Either she didn't care or was so blind that she couldn't see it when I was trying to directly explain it to her. But every time she became acutely aware that I was in horrible amounts of pain, not that I was the best communicator as a teenaged male on freaking antidepressants and shit, but um, 
Every time my mother became clearly aware that I was in pain and that she had hurt me, she would fall to tears abruptly. She'd be going from being a bitch to me to be in absolute tears and begging for my forgiveness with nothing in between, which is not an example of having a healthy, communicative relationship with a parent. I'm sure you could all at least relate to that fact, right? And so now that Bo's mother has effectively killed him, she regrets everything she's just said and ever done to him and is wailing for him. And the crowd is apathetic and the, and the male judge is disappeared from the screen and all you can hear is the slowly quieting wails as she's being carried off of the mother regretting everything she's just done. And that's the end of the movie. And it was so profound to me because what that was all about was a single mother that has robbed a boy of male role models and taught him to either be afraid of or mistrust women and also to destroy his idea of what a woman should be because a mother is supposed to demonstrate for her son what a good woman is. Just like fathers teach sons how to be boys, a mother is an example of, is supposed to be the example of the woman to seek out. And Bo, through having a deranged mother and no father, in, in constantly being blamed for everything and, and traumatized and re-traumatized over and over again and isolated over and over again. That is why he's an incel. That's why he has no conception of how to be assertive that isn't violent or isn't completely misguided. He has no idea how to stand up for himself. He has no idea how to protect himself. He has no idea how to relate to anybody. He has no uh, way of see even seeing people as anything other than a threat. And, and women is the death of him. And when he finally confronts all this, it doesn't work out. And it goes about as horribly as possible. And it re-injures him and it doesn't transform him and it doesn't metamorph him into anything good. It just further re-aggravates this emasculated, diseased, broken thing that he is. And of course his mother is just a monster, but the little silver lining in this is that one thing that is, is really kind of almost magical in a world I don't think has much, if any, magic in it, is that there are some ex exceptions to this for like truly crazy and deranged women. But most women, even if they have a very, very broken relationship with their sons, mothers with broken relationships with their sons, there's nothing more incorrigible and stubborn than a mother's love for her son. Because my, even though I, whether right or wrong, blamed my mother for a lot of the bad shit in my early life. Um, my mother loved me deeply through all of that the best she knew how. It's just like for a lot of people, sometimes the best they can do is very bad. And that's really sad. And that's really dark. And that's part of how this movie really affected me. Because even though it was a Bo was this broken, loathsome, pitiful little thing, freaking creature this golem like thing that he is and Bo is afraid I related to him but I only related to him through my own darkest fears through my own deepest shames and that's what was very emotionally powerful about this movie is I didn't really relate to Bo as I am now like Bo is the is the me of my nightmares because I still have dreams about those bad times and I have dreams where in, the, in those dreams, you know, I, I blame myself more than I ever took responsibility for anything back then. And maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. But it makes the dreams way more scary when you're aware that it's a lot of things are your fault and your responsibility. And part of being a man is being aware of and in, in having a real respect for and maybe even fear of appropriate fear of responsibility. It requires courage and bravery to be a healthy man. And Bo had none of the above, because this is a movie about a cowardly man, a broken man, a dickless man, a sexless man. And it's not really disparaging to Bo at all, hardly at all. And in fact, Bo 
never sees or feels responsibility or takes responsibility for anything he's done until it's far too late at the end of the movie. It isn't until the end of the movie that this movie ever want, seems to want the audience to blame Bo for anything. So you can't say this is a, a misandrist or man-hating movie because Bo is initially charming to some extent and sympathetic. And it's not until you get deeper and deeper and deeper into his journey that he starts to become less relatable, less sympathetic and more confusing. And then when you're finally provoked by what this movie's really about, Bo seems almost as bad as his mother because Bo is not a young boy in like the advocate in the ending part says before he's dashed on the rocks, he was just a boy. He was innocent. It was not his fault. But you can't get to how old Bo is, and I think in this movie he appears to be... I mean, Joaquin Phoenix is, I think, older than this, but I think the character of Bo is in his early 50s or late 40s. And... You can't get to that age being who Bo is without being something shameful and and undesirable. And... You can't get that far without taking some responsibility for yourself. So that's the end of the covering of the movie. But if you ask me, how did I not turn out like Bo? It was hard. I had to realize that even though I, you know, was as a young adult, you know, very young kid and teenager, I thought I could blame my mother for everything. And it wasn't until I left the house and, and had to be responsible for myself that I started making some very serious mistakes my first few relationships with women did turn out poorly and some of it was my fault and some of it was really not because I was not, I didn't have a great demonstration of the women, healthy women I should be seeking out. And I probably wasn't the kind of man at 20, 21 that would be desirable to a good woman. And I had to get to where I am now by taking responsibility and I had to do what Bo tried and kind of failed to do, which is I had to, like the, I guess the Jordan Peterson way of putting it, would be to go into the belly of the beast and rescue your father. Well, I had to creep into the attic of the absence of father and realize I couldn't blame my father who was never there. In fact, I never did until I kind of went through therapy and realized that I had a suppressed resentment towards this man who never existed in my life. Um, but that I also had to realize that I am now a man and I am now responsible. And the man that I was at that young, younger age was not a good man. I was a bad man. I was not innocent. I was not blameless. And I was no longer only a child. And I had to take personal responsibility for myself and also then start losing resentments towards others. Regardless of whether or not I have a good reason to blame my mother or any of her ex-boyfriends or or blame any of my family, the rest of my blood family from living out of state and, and being inaccessible to me when I needed some other form of support or, or blaming, you know, any kind of friends that I didn't know anymore that I had depended on at one point or another. I couldn't blame them for their absence or for their failures. I could only take responsibility for what I have done and realize that it doesn't matter what they would have done. If I don't look at me and if I don't change me, I can't get better. I can't build healthy relationships with women. I can't seek out positive male role models and even become one for younger men and teach them from my experience, especially younger men who more and more often exist these days, fatherless and raised by a mother who cares, but is still either re-traumatizing or misguiding their child. You know, I had to look at myself and see myself as the dick monster and as the mute, retarded rage beast guy too. I had to confront every piece in face of my masculinity before I could develop a cohesive man that I like. I like me. Part of the reason why I'm an arrogant prick who gets to think I can tell strangers on the internet what to do is because I think I'm pretty fucking cool. I, I, I have self-love to the point of arrogance. And I like being this way. I recommend it. I think it kind of kicks ass. And even if I'm kind of a dick sometimes, I'm generally a likable dick. And I'm glad I'm not Bo. But part of why I loved this movie 
is because I had the balls to look at this ridiculous and kind of freaky and shameful and, and, and ugh, just heebie-jeebie type movie about the worst kind of man. And I had to not just see it for what it is, which is horrifying. It's not funny. It's horrifying. But it's not just horrifying because it's bad. It's horrifying because it's me. And that's what the, the, the Carl Jung thing, to get away from Freud and into Carl Jung and finish with this piece of philosophy or um, psychology philosophy, is rather than thinking about fucking your mother or cocaine, Carl Jung, a student of Freud, developed the concepts of the ego and the id and the superego. And all that kind of comes into the movie too. But what a lot of people have heard, and it's been popularized by Jordan Peterson, but a lot of people love kind of relating to the movies is what the shadow is is not the ego, which is kind of your normal self and not usually your best self and not your id, which is your animalistic desires, whether it's for thrill seeking or drugs or sex or food or comfort or whatever, just do the bestial things you need and not the super ego, which is your best self. What the shadow is, is your worst self. The shadow is the worst things you're capable of. The shadow is the worst things you have done and, and could do and will do. And within the shadow, there's potential for growth, but within it is also the potential for complete self-destruction. And coming through that trial of facing yourself is its own archetypal thing. Most people probably would recognize it most from, I'm sorry, I swear this is the last example, Empire Strikes Back when Yoda is training Luke. And he, he asks him to go into some place where Luke senses great danger. And Yoda, even though he's sensing danger, Yoda says, do not take your weapon. You will not need it. And Luke's like, are you crazy? And he goes in there with the weapon. And what is Luke faced with? But Darth Vader, his greatest fear, his very real greatest threat. L Luke lashes out in violence against this Darth Vader. But when he beheads it and the mask falls off Darth Vader, it is not Darth Vader. It is Luke. He has just slain himself. That is a visual representation of facing your shadow. And it's usually extremely traumatizing and shaking. And it breaks your, some of your conception, some of your perception and worldview. And the healing comes from replacing that broken worldview that you've learned about through the shadow with something better, with something righteous with something heroic or masculine or just something good. So I was glad I was able to add that little PSA thing on here, and I hope this wasn't too gay and emotional for you, but uh, I really liked this movie because even though it was very scary, it's one of the scariest movies I've ever seen because it was about a very real thing. It's about me. But after seeing that horrific ending, I was able to think about, well, am I Bo? Even though I am, or at least was Bo, am I Bo now? No. And I felt much better. And I slept well that night. Thanks for watching.